Hello, everyone. Welcome, replay viewers. Today, I thought I would talk about math manipulatives. So, I'm going to give a little time for people to hop in here. As a former math teacher, I thought I would share the math. Hello, hello, everyone. I see some hearts. I thought I would share some math manipulatives that I keep in my closet. I'm Mary and I blog and Facebook and all that good stuff at notbefore7.com. So I'll put that there. Um, and I've been asked a lot about math and I thought I would make that one of my enchanted scopes because I think using manipulatives in math can help add a little enchantment to your math class. And I was a math teacher. Um, actually, I was an elementary school teacher. The light in here is really harsh. I'm not sure what to do with it. I was an elementary school teacher for a while, and then I moved on. I got certified in math, and I taught middle school math for years. My favorite topic is actually algebra. I have a child about to get there. We're in pre-algebra right now. Um, but I do love manipulatives from elementary school, and I still have three children in elementary school. I actually have four, seventh, fifth, third, and first. And um, so I just thought I would show you what I keep in my math manipulative closet and how to use it. So we'll try to keep this not too long, um, but here we go. The first thing I'm going to show you are the base, base 10 blocks. I keep them stored just like this in this little container. And base 10 blocks are great for teaching place value. These are your tens. These are your ones. Excuse me, I need to get that open. And these are your hundreds. I actually used to have thousand cubes. Thousands were actually a cube but I found that I could really get away with the concept with just the ones, tens, and the hundreds. And the thousand cubes were paper and they were just becoming a little difficult to store. So what this shows kids is in our base 10 system, as soon as we get 10 ones, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. as soon as we get 10 of these, we exchange up for one of these. So this makes a lot of sense when they're adding and subtracting. This works really well with carrying and borrowing. So I'm gonna show you how I do it with them. So let's avoid the hundreds for now. Let's just do a basic one. I also, um, this is my dining room table. It is not normally this neat and organized. You can see I hid everything down here. <laughs> I just threw everything on chairs. Um, but I painted it with chalkboard paint so that I can write on it and I love it. So. Let's say you give your child the problem 39 plus 42. I would have them write that. And then what we would do is we would build it above it. So here's 39. Skip 30. Yeah, these, I actually, I have snap cubes down there. We'll get to those. These work, these really are my favorite tool. Um, keep looking around. Sometimes you can find them used online. I know here in Raleigh, we have a used homeschool store. Sometimes there's Facebook groups where you could buy these from someone because they really are worth it. So when I have the kid build 39 and 42, then I say, okay, we're going to add. So we add them together. Now we have to look in this column, and if we have 10 or more, we have to exchange up. So of course, we know that we do have 12. So we actually, yeah, we have a used homeschool store. It's really awesome here in Raleigh. So we actually take these 10, and we exchange the 10 units for one of these, and we can now visually see our answer is 81. Oh, sorry. I didn't exchange 10. I did teach math, I promise. And here's 81. Ah, Elizabeth's chiming in. She's also from Raleigh, and it is the homeschool gathering place. So this is how you would use them to add. And of course, you would just add hundreds 
and exchange up even more if you are carrying. So these are really great. I'll show you how I do it with borrowing. Excuse me, I've got my little towel here. Um, it also adds the enchantment if you're doing it on uh, the table. So I highly recommend the chalk table. All right, let's borrow here. Let's do um, 71 minus 36. Okay, so we'll write the problem and then I have them build it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 71 and 30. Oh, I'm sorry. When I'm doing subtraction, I only build the first number. Because what I like to point out to them is I say, okay, we start with our ones. We have one unit, we need to take away six. And of course they go to take away six and there aren't six to take away. And so we have to discuss that. Well, what are we gonna do? Because you can't take away six and it's a nice visual. So you don't build the second number when you're doing subtraction. Only build the first number so that they see right away, oh, hey, I'm trying to take away six and I can't. So right away we need to borrow. So we turn this in and, and we record it. I have the kid record it as I do it. So we're gonna turn in this, which means we're taking one of these away and there's now only six left. We record it as we're doing it. And then we pull out 10 of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here's 10. And we add it there. And then we record that here. Now, depending on where your child is, you know, if you can say, okay, we've taken 10, we can count it here. How many do we have now? Well, we have 11. Oh, I see my husband just joined. Hello, he's upstairs. <laughs> so now we have 11 and they have a visual representation of what they just did in the math problem. So now I say, okay, well now we have 11, can we take away those six? And we can come over here and we can take away six and we can record that there were five left. And we have six here, we can take away three. So that's the key. When you're adding, you want to build both numbers and then group them together and do your work with the blocks. And when you're subtracting, you want to just build the top number and then let them visually take away what's left. Thank you, everyone enjoyed that. Thank you for the hearts. Um, are there any questions about base 10 blocks? They're a pretty basic math thing. I know a lot of people know how to use them, but I just thought I'd show you the way. And one key, and I haven't mentioned this, but with all math manipulatives, expect playtime when you pull them out. Do not pull these out and show them to your child to do a math problem and think you're just gonna get right into the math. They will want to build forts and they will want to build little houses and they will want to see if they can stack them on top of each other. Yes, that is what they do, right? they want to play with it. So it's one reason that actually my math manipulatives all sit in a cabinet in the other room and they are accessible for the kids at any time because that helps. If they play with them on a random day that we don't even use them for math and they built forts all day with the t base 10 blocks, then when I do use them for math, it's easier to get right to the math because they've had play time. I know some people think the opposite's true. Oh, well, if you let them play with them as toys, they think they're a toy. Okay, good. They are a toy, have fun with them. That way when you're going, hey, we're gonna use base 10 blocks for math, they're like, yay, we're playing with toys and math today. That's great. All right, let's look at the next thing. Yeah, we love toys. All right, my next item are tangrams. Tangrams are the infamous square. You know, I didn't think about this. I'm gonna put this down here for a second. I didn't think about the fact that it's very hard to open some of these baggies while I am holding the phone. So I'm gonna do that right now. Tangrams were an ancient Chinese puzzle. So if you're studying ancient China, it's a great time to invest in tangrams. And these, there's like a whole little tale about them that an emperor was trying to have um, a, somebody solve the puzzle of how to put the, um, the square back together that was in pieces. So you, here's what you get. You get seven pieces and here they are. It's like a shattered piece of glass and you are supposed to be able to manipulate them and put them back into a square. And honestly, I should have looked myself up um, Mom, how to remember it. to do it. I have a kid yelling from the other room, Mom, I can do it. <laughs> Come do it, Kaylee. <laughs> 
Yeah. So that's the challenge is these seven pieces and my daughter is gonna quickly come put them together. I'm pretty sure I can do this. Hold on. This could take a minute. Trisha knows how. I would do it too. <sighs> Wait, Trisha, you figure this out. Trish, here, right here. Wait, I think that's yeah. it. Well, there's a mini one. There's a mini square. And there's another oh, square. Oh, let me erase this, Trisha. I know how to do this. I'll copy you. Obviously, everyone likes the tangrams since all the kids have flocked into the room to make the square. Here you go. That's it. Once you get the two triangles there. Yeah, no, that's wrong. Now, there's a reason yeah. that these tangrams are reflecting. They are actually a special piece for an overhead transparency. There we go. Yeah. What? I know, but they both that? did it. <laughs> you need a... Uh, awesome. So here we have it. There's our square from our seven broken pieces. And the reason that these are see-through, I'm going to show you on the Building paper credits. in just a second. All right, Kaylee, I need this now. Aha. Can't do it. I bought several Tangram books, and I put them in page protectors that allow the kids to manipulate the Tangrams. This is really for your visual spatial kids. In fact, the kid that just ran in this room and threw it together, the red one, do you have that book too? There's a lot of good Tangram books. Um, thanks, Amy, for chiming in. It's a good one, isn't it? Um, she is really a visual spatial learner. She's my artist. She loves art. So it makes sense that she came running in here and could put it together right away. Um, so the, the reason I did the see-through ones, these were back in the day when I taught school, they were for the overhead. But when your kid is playing with them on the paper, it's really helpful that they can see through the tangram. Because with the solid ones, they could be building something on here and not realize that they weren't following the design underneath. So these see-through ones, these overhead ones, make it really easy if you have like a, I don't know if Amazon has them, but if you have a store nearby, to see if you've put the wrong piece. Because a kid with a solid one could slip this triangle in here and realize that um, it, it, it didn't fit. They, they might not realize that. I do not have light box, but this would be awesome for light box, the way these go together. So it's just all kinds of things, and there's challenges in this particular book. So it tells you, you need to use three of the shapes to make this. You need to use three of the shapes to make this. And then, thanks guys. Yeah, it was, it was just one of those random things that happened because I had the overhead from teaching school, and I realized, wow, I'm really glad I had this. Um, and then here you have seven. The seven figures will also make um, a trapezoid, not just the infamous square. But if you're doing ancient China, it's a great little tie-in for some math fun one day. So, any questions about the tangrams? I'll put them back together in a moment. I actually have four. I have four kids, so I have four sets. All right, another favorite here is the geoboards. The geo boards are these little rubber band boards. I'm going to try to put the phone back down again. The geo boards are these little rubber band boards. On this side is just the squares, and on this side there is a circle. And then it comes with a bag of rubber bands. And I'm going to show you. My kids have been playing with some of them. So this is what they often look like when I pull them out of the math closet. These are just a lot of fun to play on, but in terms of doing the math, I bought a book that has some reproducible designs. So again, this is just a visual spatial activity of trying to recreate the designs that they see. Um, some of them are harder than they look, but in terms of teaching the math. On the back, I won't go through it a ton, but this one is great for a clock. In fact, I'm doing time with one of my children. I should leave this out for tomorrow. Um, I need a smaller rubber band here. But obviously, you can do the hands of the clock around and talk about what time it is. And it's kind of nice because as your kids get older and you're just doing that visual of a clock, the fact that there's no numbers on this really helps just associate those the hand placements with being time. And I like that as they kind of grow older and away from the concrete, you know, counting by fives, but to be able to visually look at a clock and be like, oh, that looks about five o'clock. So I would let my older kids play around with this and say, show me what it looks like when it's 510 and see if they can 
come up with it. On this side, this is the side I use a lot more. Um, we've been doing angles. So I might say to my kids, hey, I want you to make me an obtuse angle. So they're gonna have to take the rubber band. This is interesting to do kind of backwards. I'm gonna look at what I'm doing. And let's make an obtuse angle. There we go. So I have an obtuse angle. And we could then make an acute angle and see how that just becomes moving one side over here. And of course, we can then translate this into making an acute triangle. And we can talk about what makes that acute. These work really well too when you get into isosceles um, and you want to make them with equal angles because these are all evenly spaced, you can um, make equal sides. So I'm, I'm building one right now. I might talk about this being a right angle. And then we could count. This distance is two units and this distance is two units. But when we cl connect to the side here, what kind of triangle do we have? Well, we can name it by its angle, right angle, and we can name it by its sides. Well, this was two units and this was two units. This one is longer to get all the way across because we're moving on the diagonal. Be careful, that's not two units. So you might have to talk about that a little bit. But this distance is not the same as the diagonal distance. So this is an isosceles triangle. Last one. Um, so this is an isosceles triangle. Isosceles right triangle. So I love this for geometry, making shapes. Um, it's another just great, um, great fun to play with. So that's why when I open the closet, I often see things like this. All right, that's it for geoboards. Great stuff for geometry. And um, I saw a lot of new people popping in. So just real quick, I would add, um, again, I'm Mary. I blog at Not Before 7. You can find me on Facebook. My page is Not Before 7. And I'm a former math teacher, now homeschooling mama four. And I'm glad you guys are here. And I'm just going through my math manipulative closet and what we play around with here when um, we are trying to make math an enchanted subject. So my next one are the patterns. These are also lots of fun to play with. These are in lots of houses. Um, these just come in several different shapes. And of course, one of the most fun things the kids like to do with these is just make designs on the table. You just need a nice little open area. And let me see what shapes we have in here. That we still need to get. These work well um, for all sorts of math stuff. Obviously, you can do patterns. They're pattern blocks. You can set up a pattern, you know, yellow, red, yellow, red, and have your kindergartner fill in the rest of the pattern. These work great for fractions. You can talk about a half, and you can actually manipulate the half. And then you could take this triangle and put it on top and say, okay, well, what fraction is this triangle? And if your child's having a hard time, you can go in and get more triangles. That's what's nice about manipulatives is that you can then manipulate the math. And they could fill in all six, six of these and say, hey, that's, you know, one triangle is just one sixth. And they can see it over here on the trapezoid. They could do one third and you could play around with them. I also have this book that I really like. Um, I love going through this with everyone because I'm remembering fun things to do with my younger kids that they haven't done yet. And it gives you ideas. It starts with just some fun stuff, building roads, and then, let's see, filling in shapes with colors. Decide what color you think can do it ahead of time. So visually, they're trying to plan which one would work and then they actually do it. Use at least five blocks, make a shape you could fold into equal parts. So here you go, you've got symmetry. They're creating a shape that could be symmetrical and showing where the fold line is. So this is just another great book. I'll put it there in case any screenshots wanna go um, if you have pattern blocks to play with. So the next thing that I wanna talk about, I have snap cubes. Somebody, I think, said Unifix cubes. Maybe they're the same thing. I don't know. I think it was Amy saying that. I don't know if hers are the same or different than this. But this basically comes with 10 um, of 10 colors. And each one, each color has 10. And there are 10 colors in there. My favorite thing to do with these is, of course, making 10s. Because making 10s is really important in math. 
and this is a way to show it so visually. So I don't use it like I used the base 10 blocks I talked about at the beginning with adding and subtracting. No, you can, but it's not gonna work very well for carrying and borrowing and stuff like the base 10s do. But it's a really nice visual when you want to show how seven and three make 10. And you can keep, I didn't have any, I should have had. I typically keep one built as a 10. Let's do this. Um, I typically keep one of them that's built as a 10 so it could stand next to it and you could see that it was seven and three. I'm trying to build one real quick, but I don't know. Who knows if I have all the red. Typically, when I open my math cabinet and look for the snap cubes, they're all just turned into weapons and people have just built guns with them because I have two boys. <laughs> this is what they look like. Yes, you gotta look. So I keep one that is 10, and then I can hand my child seven and say, how many more do we need to get 10? And we'll have seven. We'll add three in there. So it just becomes a very visual way to make 10. And that's really what I use them for. Making 10 is just a really important elementary math skill. Since we have a base 10 system. Um, the next manipulative I have in the closet actually comes from a math curriculum I don't use anymore. It was called It's a Montessori based curriculum. It was a great curriculum. It just didn't work for me in the long run. So I used their early level, but I love this that came with it. And I don't know if you can order this separate, but it puts the numbers on these cards that you can line up to make numbers. I have a, I should look, you can, I can show you that it's Schiller Math again, um, cause that might be something, somebody wants to screenshot if they're interested, they can order this. But you can make the number 8,791. And like you know, a lot of times books will say, what is the seven worth in this number? What is the value of the number seven? And it's very easy to see the seven is worth 700 because it's in the hundreds place. It also works really well when teaching expanded notation because you can line these up and then you can go ahead and actually move it to say 8,791 is 8,000 plus 700 plus 90 plus one. And they can actually manipulate it with the place values. So this is just something left over from a curriculum that didn't work for me, but I have really enjoyed this in terms of being able to talk about the value of each digit in bigger numbers. So again, that was from Schiller Math. You could check their website and see if it's something you could order. And we're almost done here. The last thing is of course, just having some solids. This is from edX Education. I think I just got it off of Amazon because moments where I was about to teach solids and I needed something to arrive within two days. So I got on Amazon Prime, saw what they had, and we have actually enjoyed the set of solids and we play around with that. But it's really important when you're starting to teach volume and talk about faces that kids can put their hands on the object. And so when you're asking them, how many faces does a cube have? You know, you could put little sticker dots on here as you're counting to keep track and they can actually feel, this is what you mean by a face, okay? And that's, that's really important for a lot of our kids who need that concrete feeling. And then they can explore with this and count the faces around it. So these could probably dry erase right off and you could keep track of things that way. And you can of course then talk about, um, Pyramids versus prisms, they're in here. So whatever it is that you're studying. So this is just a nice little kit of solids and I just let my kids play with it. They, you know, need to put it back when they're done, but they just go at it and build things. And so the last thing I wanna show you, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about, but these were the other things sitting in my math manipulative closet, was a deck of cards, <laughs> a thing of buttons, marbles, and dice. And those are just some other things I keep in the same two shelves. Oh, I didn't mean to turn that. Let's... So all of the manipulatives we talked about tonight are sitting on the same two shelves in a closet. And 
they're quick and easy for me to grab. If suddenly I'm in the middle of teaching something and the kid's not quite getting it, I can just run right in there and grab what I can use. And like I said before, do not expect to put manipulatives in front of your child and have them immediately ready to do the math and use the manipulative in the appropriate mathematical way. They're gonna need a little playtime first. So go ahead, have fun, um, build some things first, and then work in the math. Um, that's why I leave them handy, because my kids play with them all the time. So I guess that's everything. That's what's in my math manipulative closet. I think I'm gonna have to do one on math games, but this has been part of the Enchanted Scope series from Julie at Brave Writer. I'm sorry, I don't have my note card, but it is Brave Writer. If somebody wants to just type in the comments, Brave Writer, that would allow people who are watching on a replay and want to screenshot that could then see it. And it's just a way that we make math a little more enchanting around this place. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but hopefully I was able to go everything. Thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth went ahead and put Brave Writer in there for us. That's who is, um, given the challenge of enchanting scopes. And again, for people who joined in at the end, um, this was a talk on math manipulatives. And I am Mary, and you can find me on my blog at Not Before 7 and on Facebook. So thanks so much for tuning in, guys, and inviting your followers. Thank you for um, also putting that hashtag. It should have been up in the title, but I'm not seeing my title. It might appear again. All right, thanks guys, and um, I'm hoping to keep forcing this Periscope thing, as awkward as it feels, on Mondays and Wednesdays. So I will see you all. Oh, actually, I'll be camping. So I might pop in here over the weekend instead of on Monday because we will be camping on Monday. So I will see you guys this weekend. Thanks a lot.